So let's have this started. Um, my name is Jordi Torres. I am from Barcelona. This picture over there is that city, Barcelona. And for those of you who have not been there, if you yell Jordi, 50% of the male population <laughs> will come out. Everybody is called like that. So I'm not very excited. That's why I came here. Because it's very annoying to be called like everybody else. Um, human progress is exponential. We know that. We, we can measure that. We've seen how technology has been progressing in the last decades, even uh, centuries, in an exponential way. So when it comes to exponential growth, actually trying to see what's going to happen in the future is, is difficult. You can see in this graph, this, in, this, in this chart here, how if we use a linear prediction of what's, go what, what's going to happen in the future, just taking a look at what is happening now, we're going we're gonna to miss basically what is the actual uh, situation in the future. And even if we take a back a little bit on what is the growth and we assume uh, um, a linear growth, we're also going to miss as well. So when it's, it's time to see what's going to happen in the future, we have to think in terms of exponential growth. And that's uh, applying to all kind of, of events. And particularly, if we take an, in, a look into artificial intelligence, I'm going to talk about that today, basically. But there is one thing that is important. is It is happening. It's been happening for a while now. Maybe not under the name artificial intelligence, but that chart is very interesting. This chart basically shows different economic um, indicators profits after tax for, for companies in the, in the United States for the last years, uh, general GDP. And one important uh, indicator here, one important figure is the ratio of people working divided by the total population. And what you can see is this red line. And the gray areas have been basically the last well-known crisis that we have uh, suffered. And what you can see is in in the, every crisis, uh, all the indicators go down, and there is less profits, and GDP goes down, and of course, um, 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 employment goes down. But if you if you think how is the, the what happens after the crisis, but you will see the only indicator that actually goes consistently down is this ratio, the ratio of people working. So every crisis, that line goes down. And what is, is, is happening now is we do more with less. It's happening. I, nobody knows when the next crisis is going to happen. But, but that's basically a, an interesting pattern. Is this artificial intelligence? Well, we don't know. But what we do know is that this is a trend that's not recent. It's been happening for, for, the, last, for the last years. Now, talking about predictions and artificial intelligence, um, I would like to introduce this guy. For those of you who are, who are as old as me, um, we know HAL 9000. This is the bad guy of a movie that was recorded in 1968. I know that because I was born that year too. So a couple of things that this guy was able to do in the movie. <coughs> he could, of course, play chess. He could have conversations. He had a, a huge starship in perfect shape until the guy goes mad and kills everybody. But that's part of the movie, right? He's able to play chess. He's able to even read leaps. So not only understanding people speaking, but actually looking at how people are moving their lips. And based on that, understanding what, what they, they were saying, because they were trying to hide from him. He's able to lie. He's able to have strategies to kill everybody in the starship. And this. The movie is called 2001, so that was the prediction on how technology was going to be in 2001. So the question is, how was technology in 2001? It was that. That is 2001. <laughs> the most intelligent thing that you could find is the, the Microsoft clip, which <laughs> was not very smart, right? <coughs> this is the Windows XP. It was a you know, good operating system, but no, no, no intelligence, no intelligence here whatsoever. And these are some of the predictions 
that have been going on in, in, the, in the AI. Speaking of technology. As the trend continues. I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're here, we're good, all right. Um, within 10 years, digital computers will be the world's chess champion. In 1958, well, in 1968, no computer was the chess champion of anybody. Machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. That's 65. So in 85, ignore this device. Cancel. Okay. All right. Um, that's the artificial intelligence we have in 2015. Um, within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will be substantially solved. Well, I think it's not solved. We are, you're going to see what's going on, but it's not, it's not solved yet. And uh, in from eight years, we'll have a machine with general intelligence of an average human year. So that was supposed to happen in three or eight years. Let's say 80. It did not happen. So there are so many promises of AI that have been already happening and then such a big disappointment that people now talk about winters. AI winters. And it's been only one, it's been at least two. So if you take a look to this period, this first green area, 1952, all the way to 1994, <coughs> this is when the Space Odyssey movie was, was done. And back then, these perceptrons, which today we call neural networks, they were about to take the world. And that's what everybody thought. But it didn't happen. So after that, it was the AI winter, which basically says, Big disappointment, nothing is going on. Now, AI came back, basically in the 80s, and there's things like Express Systems, and, um, and um, Lisp, and Prolog, and Inference Engines. Everybody was talking about that, and it looked like the, we were about to get there. The technology was good enough, but it was not. Again, over-promising, and a new winter came, and this time was an even longer winter. So. Talking about what is artificial intelligence, um, I, I like this chart because basically it gives a progression of what we can call artificial intelligence. So on the bottom, it's not even AI, we call computing. When, when we take a calculator today, that guy is thousands of times smarter than me at doing arithmetic calculations. We don't call it AI, but somebody in the Middle Ages, maybe he could. Then after that, we have automation. And today, jobs are being lost because of automation. We know that. It's, it's happening everywhere. The second layer is the narrow intelligence, which is intelligence that is useful for one particular subject, for one particular task. And if you also think about it, you will see that John McCarthy, in 1956, he said, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. And every time we take the, our maps application, and it tells us the, the best way to go every time we let Siri understand what we say. This is AI, but we are so used to it that we don't call it AI anymore. But it is AI. It's just pushed back into the automation. Everybody, every time we, if we are used to it, it's like, oh, that's not AI. That's just computer, just automation. So what is the top of the, of the, of the intelligence? Well, the yellow area is this general intelligence is a machine, a computer, a system that is as intelligent as a human. We're not there yet. We're not, we're far from being there. But maybe one day we'll be there. And what is really scary is the top of the pyramid, which is the super intelligence, when these machines will be more intelligent than us. <coughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know when that's going to happen. I'm not going to promise this here because between the optimistic exponential growth model kind of view, plus all the winters that we have already seen is very difficult to, to know. But I, what I'm talking, what I'd like to talk today is why we came out of this winter now. Why now? Well, if we take a look to these pictures, we know what they are. Humans, take a look to that, say, well, dogs. That's very easy. Um, if we take a look to these other pictures, we'll say, uh, cats. We are very, use, very use, used to identify that. It's our visual cortex that can take an image and exactly know what is, just by taking a, a few, few, even 
even if we see not only the full picture, but just a part of it, we, our visual cortex can also tell what it is. For example, um, what, what is that? A what? A zebra. A zebra, right? Well, it's not a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this guy is an okapi. But hey, we don't see okapis every day. We see cats and we see dogs. So our visual cortex is learning, is, is, has a knowledge of the world, simplifies things. When we saw the other image, we say, well, I gotta be a zebra, right? Versus is not, and believe it or not, one day I was doing this pitch, and I, I, I was doing the smart ass kind of, kind of comment, what is that? And somebody said, I'm a copy. <laughs> I said, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I said, well, I live in Amsterdam, right in front of the zoo. And there is a cage with an okapi. So I see the guy every day, and he knew. He knew that, you know, the pattern, and he recognized that okapi was not even a zoologist. But that's how, how our, our, our brain work. And basically, this is how AI has been reborn again. So this is a, a neuron. This is an actual neuron. And um, biologists and scientists have observed how neurons work. And it's apparently simple. So one neuron is pretty simple. It gets a number of inputs from all these axons. And in based, based on these inputs, the guy decides if has to trigger an output or not. It's very simple, actually. This output is then connected to these many other neurons that do the same. And that way, they create layers and layers of neurons connecting to each other. The very first neurons are our senses. Our <coughs> eyes have neurons connected, our ears have ears connected, and the output is basically our muscles. So when I wake up, take the phone, and I speak, and my mouth is moving, this is basically the output layer of an actual neural network, which is our, our, our brain. And see an example here of how many neurons are out there. This is called the cerebral cortex, which is only the neurons of the surface of the brain. And here is a list of animals. Um, actually, it's a list of mammals, because apparently reptiles and birds don't have a cerebral cortex, which doesn't mean they're stupid. It's just they don't have a cerebral cortex. We don't know how they work. But from the 4 million neurons of a mouse to all the way to 37 billion neurons of a, of a whale, there's way different capacity of computing in neural networks. And humans are pretty good, not the most, but actually we are smaller than a whale, right? So, so comparing size and the number of neurons in our uh, cerebral cortex, humans are exceptionally dotated with the number of neurons. So what's, what's happening here is taking the simplicity of a neuron is actually easy to build it using computers. That model here is an actual artificial neuron, which is nothing more than a number of items of inputs times a, a specific weight, a different weight for each one. All added, that number goes above a, a certain uh, threshold, then the neuron triggers an output. Otherwise, it does not. Very simple. So that, with that, that graph here is the output model. That, that function, is, it works like that. So if a number of inputs goes above a certain threshold, it will react, the neuron will trigger an output and it will go all the way to the um, high part of the function. Now, what is a neural network? Well, it's all these neurons connecting to each other. The green layer is the input layer. Whatever it is, is it going, can be a, an image, can be a um, natural language sentence. It could be um, anything. It could be a, a, a radar detection in a self-driving car. It goes to after every layer, and the output is a decision. Is the car turning around? Is it stopping? Is the, uh, the natural language question understood? This is basically what um, neurons do and the artificial neurons do. And it's old. Actually, the 52 this animal was already invented, and they call it perceptron. They didn't call it neural network. Then they came back in the 90s. They call it then neural networks. And uh, it was there, but it was abandoned. It was abandoned because as 
interesting as it seems, it was difficult to train. They made actually very interesting applications. The problem was, how can you train this guy? And train the, a neural network is basically finding a way to know which is the best numbers that you have to put in every weight. And this is complicated. So they made it. That's what happened. And that happened last year. And deep learning was born. What deep learning is nothing else than an, a better algorithm to train neural networks. And the way it works is instead of trying to understand a neural network as a multi-layer thing that you train from the output <coughs> back to the input, what these guys do is they train every layer independently. So every layer of neurons take care of a different abstraction layer. They get more and more abstract into the ideas <coughs> from an input to the extreme that they actually get an output. And, and it worked. They were able to actually build a software that you put a picture in it, and the guy says, that's a dog, or that's a cat, or that's none of the above. It seems like a stupid application, right? Because at the end of the day, dogs and cats are very smart already doing this. They know perfectly if they're walking to a mate or not. But from a computer, it's exceptionally difficult. We are, we are here replacing the virtual cortex, which is um, a device that has evolved for millions of years to do what we are able to do that and many other animals do, do as well. So after the, the exciting dog and cat experiment, say, OK, what else can we, can we do? So there's this game on the left. Right? So probably, I don't know if you guys have you heard about that. This is a game that um, has existed in China for thousands of years. It's called Go. And I have no idea how to play it, but apparently it's all about moving the white and black pieces. And, and you, you, you play against someone, each one has a color, and if you take a look to all these potential combinations, how, in how many ways that game can be organized, the total number is more than the total number of atoms in the universe, which is a big number. So it's so big that cannot be computed. Cannot be, there's, it's impossible to take a computer that by using brute force computes all the possibilities trying to find the best move. That's impossible and that's not the way the Go champions work. They use intuition. They don't know how to use, they cannot explain why they take decisions, but yet there are championships of that and they are folks that are very good at that. And then the project was, okay, can we build a machine that plays go better than the masters using deep learning? And that happened the second half of last year. <coughs> they had basically one machine that was fighting against itself all the time, just trying and trying and trying different combinations Tra training a neural network of several layers. I'm simplifying, I think it was more complicated than that, but essentially it was an application of the deep learning. And they went to the competition, they fought against the, the champion, and it was five games, and the machine won four out of five. The first one, the champion won, the second one, the machine was systematically winning the human champion. So, and that's amazing, because that game is considered to be way more complex than chess, which is the other guy. That's another application. That's where people saw, wait a minute, this is superior to the human mind. These guys can actually play better. <coughs> and then they say, okay, um, can we revisit it, chess? Because sometimes in the 70s, <coughs> they said, well, if we can able to build machines that are as modern than the champ, a, a champ in, in chess, that's artificial intelligence. Somebody said that. Nobody says that anymore because chess, you can play on your iPhone, is basically boring commodity. You don't think that as in terms of artificial intelligence, but back then it was. So they said, okay, we have today very good software that play chess today by applying brute force, by analyzing <coughs> hundreds of millions of combinations and trying to see what is better. Using that system, actually, 
years ago, um, Dipu was able to win a chess championship against Kasparov. So they did the same. It's like, okay, that's good. Now we have it. Deep learning is going to use for Go and for many other applications. So there's a guy who tried it and put um, deep learning playing chess against itself, exactly the same that we did that they did for Go, and it didn't work. Deep learning, deep simply, was too slow and too down and was totally below any standard of the existing applications that are able to play chess today. Which is an interesting lesson because just when you saw you find the final solution to AI, you realize that just like that might not even be the best solution. You have deep learning being able to win Go, but today there is no deep learning algorithm that can beat even the simpler chess application out there, which is which is very interesting. Um, we at Inventa, we we are we work in in, in space of artificial intelligence called natural language processing, which is a technical term. A natural <coughs> language is English, Spanish, French, and we say that in contrast with a formal language. And a formal language is XML, HTML, and COBOL, and many other things that end with an L that have been invented to make computers understand each other. And computers are good at understanding formal languages. They can understand Java and PHP and all that, but <coughs> historically they've done a, a really poor uh, job at understanding humans. And I would like to, to challenge you. you. There is a sentence here on the red. It says, ship a book to France. And below there are two more sentences. Sentence number one, sentence number two. So my question here for you guys is, which of the two sentences is more similar in meaning to the sentence in red? One or two? What do you think? One. Two. Two. Two, two or one? Two, two. Two, two, right? Two. But no, you you, you gotta say two. <laughs> Not <laughs> <your> copy. <laughs> so, if you think about it, why? Well, because we are humans. We speak English. Well, you speak English better than I do. But we have a knowledge of the world. We know that France uh, is an international thing, and we know that ship a book is very different to say book a ship. Yet for a machine, this is, looks so similar. We know that because search engines are doing it wrong all the time. They just see these similarities and they will say, I got the answer. The best answer for that question is number one, but actually it's not, it's number two. Look at that, same experiment. Book a ship to France, which is the most, which is the closest sentence, one or two? I gotta say two. <laughs> So wh why is that? And how can we build machines that are able to do this? Well, we use computational linguistics, and we use natural language processing. This, this science has been out there for many years. And uh, during the, the 60s and the 70s, um, many governments invested a lot of money on that. And, and one of the, the applications that they were looking for was translation, particularly the Department of Defense was very, of the US was very interested in translating from Russian to English because of the Cold War. They say, well, we have to spy these guys and we have to know what they say so we better translate automatically. So tons of millions were invested on that. Again, the results were so-so and many of this research was abandoned. That's why the winter happened after afterwards. But, but basically, that's an example of, again, two sentences. First, up there says, instructions to change the date of a meeting, all right? Below is another question, how can I reschedule my appointment? This is what Inventa does. This is how we implement customer support, by understanding user questions and trying to see to which extent those questions can be answered by our customer's knowledge base and content. Now, this is very simple simplification how the process works, but every word is understood in the context, is analyzed, this is a verb, an adjective, there is a semantic weight, then there is what we call lexical functions. For example, change the date is rescheduled. But if I say change my name, this is not rescheduled. This is 
for example, rename. So these complex semantic relationships are important in order to understand what customers are, are asking and being able to, to give an actual um, accurate um, answer. So the question here is, what is better then? Should we use machine learning for natural language processing? Or should we use computational linguistics? That, that's, that's the big question today, and nobody knows it. There are many applications out there, many startups. Some are working heavily in machine learning. Some others are using strictly computational linguistics. But there are pros and cons. Machine learning is good with big documents, big data. It's all about big data. Machine learning works well with when there's a lot of things to learn. Um, is easier to scale? Is language independent? Because basically a machine, a, a neural network, doesn't speak any language. Versus if you use computational linguistics, you need a lexicon, you need a dictionary, you need an expert, a computational linguist, who is able to understand, analyze the language, and have a formal uh, definition of language. In the other hand, machine learning mm -hmm. is good with big documents, is not as good with uh, short sentences, like ship a book to France. That's a sentence where the machine learning will would probably fail and give the wrong answer. Um, in the other hand, uh, machine learning is more based on keywords, and it lacks the knowledge of the world. And linguistics contain the knowledge of the world. We know that change the date is rescheduled. We know that France is somewhere somehow related to international. For a machine learning application to learn that has to analyze such a huge amount of data that might not be scalable. So what is the solution? Well, I don't know. We are in this exciting moment when AI is, is growing. There is a lot of, of uh, things going on. Uh, we know that deep learning has pretty much changed the way uh, we think about artificial intelligence, but at the end of the day, <laughs> we don't know. Are we all over promising? Are we, should we scared? There are in Europe, they have now, they are now thinking about passing laws to make robots pay taxes, <coughs> which is ridiculous. It's like having a hammer and you want the hammer to pay taxes. It's a tool to me. Others will say there's a big danger in AI. AI can very quickly, because of the exponential growth, can become something that we don't understand and even overnight can literally go to the top of the pyramid, get super intelligence, and then there, there's going to be a number of questions that we're going to ask like, okay, we taught our deep learning neural networks to buy stock in the stock market, to drive a car, to take care of uh, customer relationships, but who taught these guys moral? Who taught these guys what is good and what is bad? And then we're gonna realize that nobody did. And then, potentially, there, there is a risk over there. Questions? <laughs>